All right. All right. Happy Mother's Day. Amen. It's been a great Sunday so far. Welcome to Brentwood Lighthouse Baptist Church. We are uh, having a great day. If you're just joining us online, we certainly welcome you and uh, we are glad to have you. We welcome you all to Brentwood Lighthouse Baptist Church. So joyful to have you all with us. And we welcome you in the love of Jesus Christ. And thank you for joining here with us today. If you are watching virtually, we do thank you. As we're preaching the truth of God's word, uh, we thank you all for uh, subscribing to our uh, virtual channel. Uh, we will continue to preach the truth. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, God. Lord, your truth is what we will preach, is what we will believe, is what we will honor, and is what we will continue to know in our hearts that is delivering us, bringing your miracles upon us, bringing pleasure, Lord, before your throne, that we stand on your truth, we love your truth, we honor you at your word, God. You are not a man that you should lie, or the son of man that you should repent, Father God. And we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to make it all happen for us, Lord, to extend the gift of eternal life to us. We cannot thank you enough, and we praise your holy name, and we thank you, God. Please speak to us through your word today. Continue to open up this book for us, Lord, as we venture into Titus. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Today we'll be in Titus 1, 5 through 9. Um, if you're just joining us here, uh, we're um, beginning a journey through the book of Titus. This is week two. If you didn't get to hear week one, you can still go on blb.church. And you can uh, seek last week's sermon and hear that. And I pray that you will. Um, you can be fully caught up here. Um, today's message, uh, the need for proper leadership. So not only are we preaching the truth, but we're experiencing the book of Titus together um, in a bit of an orderly fashion. And I'll do the best I can to remind you of that order and to bring it into a uh, vision each week. Uh, as we study in Titus, today we will be in chapter 1, 5 through 9. Um, this verse opens up to the occasion for Paul to write to Titus. Um, the occasion is the need for leadership. So um, those of you that are here today received a map. Hopefully you received a map here. And I, we just put these in here give you a little idea on your map um, where Crete is. Remember last week we read that uh, Paul left Titus in Crete um, as they were preaching in the Macedonian churches. You see Macedonia above Crete here. So as Paul and Titus were laboring in the Lord, building churches in the Macedonian area, um, they established churches on Crete. And Titus was left in Crete. And gives you a visual and an actual picture of what we're talking about. And exactly the occasion was there were churches there. And Paul leaving, uh, this was between Paul's first and second Roman imprisonment. And um, obviously leadership is needed. So you have young churches in Crete, in Macedonia. You have Titus being left there alone. And you have the occasion for Paul to write Titus. Now in your heart, may you know that these churches need help. Paul has stationed Titus there, and Titus is about that need for Titus to establish leaders over these churches. Praise God. Um, last week, we described the opening, which was... Uh, the founding message in the opening brought clarity 
Um, faith according to godliness. I want to point out two things that were established last week as we carry on. Um, last week, the opening revealed two main points, and they're worth remembering. One, in verse 1 through 4, Titus 1, 1 through 4, faith and knowledge of the truth leads us to godly living. Faith according to godliness. Your faith in Jesus Christ and your learning and gaining knowledge of the truth is leading you to godly life, to living according to God, following God, adapting your life to His ways, not your own, and literally changing your being from the inside out. This is happening, and it is in God's Word, and this is the truth. The second thing is that the overall theme of Titus... Paul wrote this book with an overarching theme, which is the inseparable link between faith and practice and belief and behavior. So not only is it prevalent in verse 1 through 4, but it is the overarching theme of Titus that you now know, which is between faith and practice and belief and behavior. Uh, We need God and we need Him to show us how to live according to his will. Here in week two, we see the occasion, the need for proper leadership. Let's read Titus 1, 5 through 9. Titus chapter 1, starting in verse 5. For this reason, I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not found of fond of sordid gain, but hospitable. Loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled. Lastly, in verse 9, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. It is God's will for the faithful and orderly men to lead in every church. Referenced here in Titus 5 and 6. As Paul begins the body of the letter, it contains a reminder to Titus of the directions for ministry that he had left with him. The churches in Crete did not yet have elders, and they needed to be put in godly order. The churches here are obviously fairly young. Titus is there as Paul's delegate to get these churches properly established. There you see the need for proper leadership in the exact context of Paul's writing over this man Titus, who's been left in Crete. An amazing, daunting task for Titus, I can imagine. Place yourself in Titus' shoes. And imagine the early church. Let me read verse 5 again. Titus 1.5 for, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I have directed you. Reminding Titus that he already had given him direction. Elders in verse 5 refers to mature spiritual leaders of the church. Also known as overseers, bishops, and pastors. These are shepherds who were to care for each congregation. This ministry of appointing leaders is consistently Pauline. 
Let's take a look at Acts 14, 23. Acts 14, 23 reads, When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. This is Paul's first missionary journey, referring back in Acts, consistently appointing elders over every church. The need for proper leadership. You see the term directed you in verse 5, Titus 1, 5. For this reason I left you in Crete that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Directed you is a distinct reminder of past apostolic instructions. You see, apostolic instructions are to be followed. You know how I feel about the changing of the church? You know how I feel about what's happening in the church in America? About some of these uh, non-apostolic decisions that are being made? I try not to go there too often, but what I can do and what I will do is say the apostolic instructions in the Bible are to be followed by the church. They're not to be deviated from. Christians are not to alter God's word to fit their lives. They are to practice and hope and pray for God to help them alter their lives to fit God's word. Amen? We are not to alter the word of God to fit what we want church to be. And what I can say truthfully and clearly and boldly is we're going to stay on the truth, the apostolic directions given to the church as best as humanly possible here at Brentwood Lighthouse. Amen? Amen. Amen. That is our commitment. It is very important. Above reproach, let's take a look at verse 6. Titus 1 verse 6. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. We're going to break this down a little bit. Um, this word, above reproach, does not refer to sinless perfection, but to a personal life, that is beyond legitimate accusation of public scandal. This is a general and primary requirement of spiritual leaders in the church that is often repeated. I look at this and I see myself struggling in my youth and coming from a pretty much a broken background. And I read into this and I just want to share with you, um, it doesn't mean that you don't have trouble. I myself have two daughters that uh, I did not get to father over the way that I had hoped. Today, by God's grace, they're both in their 30s, their early 30s. They're both working hard. They both have a dream. In fact, that dream is just manifesting for them to purchase a home. I feel so sorry for them because it seems so far away, but I don't want to tell them that. I don't want to tell them. I want to be hopeful for them. And they're saying, Dad, this seems impossible. But I, I pray for them and I hope for them. Both of them are working on getting married. And I encourage them. I don't rain down biblical. Uh, I don't hammer them with biblical truth. They are in the world. I didn't have that opportunity as a father. And what I say to you is, as I studied on this, there are plenty of uh, opportunities for every man to gain control of this. Is the Holy Spirit able to cleanse and heal any man? Is He able to bring any man in any situation from any background or any lifestyle into submission and bring him above reproach? Yes, He is. And that's the message that I want every man and woman to understand. God is capable of bringing single men, married men, even men that have been through broken families. It doesn't matter. The point must be driven home. The overseer develops a life above reproach. Here in verse 6, we see husband of one wife. We'll go a little further here. Our purpose is to break these scriptures down. The husband of one wife, 
having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. Uh, literally, today, if this man is married, then he would be a one-woman man. That's not too difficult. A man who's going to be a future leader in this church, this church is hungry for leaders. This church is, is uh, set to take in leaders and establish this for the future. Men who want to stand on the truth and continue living and preaching in the truth and not compromising for any reason. Regardless the outcome. This is a man who is consistently devoted and faithful to his one wife. But a man does not have to be married to become a leader in the church and to have a life that is above reproach and to be established in this category. I want to make that perfectly clear. And I read into it so that when I preach it, I can read many opinions and many versions of which man is able to come before God and lead. And that is a man who reads this word and aligns himself with it. It's not where you've been, it's where you are today. Amen? Children who believe, this is a hard one for me. I didn't get the father over my children when they were born. Uh, I believed the enemy, I believed his lies, and my family was destroyed at that time as I was just turning 30 years old. Um, yes, it helped me become a Christian. Yes, it crippled my uh, being because I realized, there was a time I realized, I'm not going to be the father over them that I wanted to be, and I'm not happy about that. It was a big part of helping me to come to Christ. So God would never use that as an obstacle to keep me from leading in Christ. He used it as an obstacle to bring me to Christ. The realization that I had lost the ability to be a father, picturing what a family is and how much I desired that, and also picturing my complete inability to accomplish that, was a major factor in bringing me to Jesus Christ. It brought me to my knees. This phrase, when we come to children who believe... There's no compromising, and there's no other way but God's word. This phrase may be directed at children living in the home, children who believe, children living in the home, young ones. Here, the elder shows that he is willing and able to lead his family in the ways of God and salvation through Christ. So, as a young Christian man, I wasn't, as a young man, as a young man, I wasn't able to lead in the church. I didn't see God's order in this. And I didn't align my life with the word which was right in front of me. And I ignored it. No man is excluded from leadership who aligns his life with this word. Young ones today, if you're a, a man with a young family, these things do apply. They come into effect. Not sinless perfection. One thing I read when I studied this was that no man can absolutely assure that salvation will be upon his children. Only God can do that. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Only God does that. No man has absolute authority over children, any children, to, to make them be believers in Christ. It helps me get a deeper understanding, and I'm trying to share that understanding. This is not exclusive to any man, and men need that. I needed to hear that. I'm standing here today because by the grace of God, I saw a way in His Word to achieve these levels, to be above reproach, to stand as a man of God, and to break through what the enemy meant for harm, God intentionally will use it for... Good. Amen. Thank you. That is a fact of the Bible. See, those are the beauty of the word of God that we get to rejoice in. What the devil meant for harm for me and my family and the upbringing of my young children, God intended to use it for good. And he absolutely will do that for you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Remember that and never forget that. Here in verse 6, we see also the words of children who believe young ones. 
We definitely have to have a, a, a somewhat of a handle to lead them to Christ, to show them the way, just not backing up uh, dis, dissipation or rebellion. In verse 6, the Bible says, Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, these are young ones, being led to Christ, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. There's a possibility that dissipation or rebellion may refer to a little bit older children or older children. Younger children and babies obviously don't rebel. They're not in dissipation and rebellion. They're not living lifestyles. I'll break this down a little. Dissipation, uncentering the soul from God. Children don't do that. They just need leadership. Young children need leadership. Dissipation can refer to an older child living a wasteful or luxurious lifestyle that dissipates. And this helped me understand clouds when they dissipate. There's no rain. Everyone knows the, what you see in the sky when clouds dissipate. Dissipation can actually refer to the spirit of a, of a, of a young adult or a child dissipating from God. Just being drawn away completely from him, possibly by a lifestyle. Moving a person away from God. Rebellious can refer to being totally rebellious to the gospel. I look at this, neither of my daughters, by God's grace, are completely rebellious to the gospel. I'm looking at myself and being honest with you. I have two daughters... My sin destroyed the ability for me to father over them the way that I wished I could have, that God would have desired. Today, both of them are open to the gospel. They both ask for prayer, asking for prayer that they might have a home someday through hard work, and I sympathize with them. They want me to pray for that for them, and that's a beautiful thing, amen? And, uh, and I do that open to the gospel. Let's take a look at 1 Timothy 3, 4, and 5. We're working through this. 1 Timothy 3, 4, and 5. Starting in verse 4. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? Today, I have learned to manage well. I want to share with men here and out there. Um, this is something that we personally take serious at Brentwood Lighthouse Church because we believe in the Word of God and the truth of God. And by standing on the truth of God and only the truth and not compromising, that a man or woman will find the life and the power and the control given by the Holy Spirit to lead that godly life. Every man here is being prayed for repetitiously that this type of event, godly order, will come into your life. I can model that for you. I can tell you how I did it. And the answer ultimately is always going to be Jesus Christ and His power. Today I stand as the CEO of the evangelistic organization the Kingdom Work Ministries that has work in India and the United States sharing the gospel. I am the chief executive officer and the founder. That is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and I am the senior pastor of Brentwood Lighthouse Baptist Church. I only say that because anything is possible. Amen? I've told you my history. I've told you my mistakes. The same in the Bible, I tell you, you take the harsh word of God and you put it with the good word of God. He'll take the things that the devil meant for harm and he'll make them for your... You have to believe that. And here at this church, we believe. I believe over the men because I've been there and I've done it. Your life will transform. You will find through prayer and dedication, you can establish yourself 
and become the leader that God says you can. There's nothing uncommon to man. No obstacle or sin is above you or more powerful than what God is doing in your life. Amen? It can be done. Never listen to the enemy to tell you, any man or woman, that you are not capable or able. That is a lie. God gives clear guidelines for His children to follow as they grow into mature believers who will lead. Let's just read 7 and 8 now. Uh, Titus 1, 7 and 8. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible. Just, devout, self-controlled. Here we see a list. This is a perfect list for you to remember these verses, to come back to Titus, to use hermeneutics and reference other verses in the Bible that coincide with this teaching. Any man or woman can find reference here to guide your life. I said I could tell you how I did it, This is one of the major reasons that I was able to overcome by believing in God's Word, looking at God's Word, finding people who had achieved these levels in God's Word, emulating them, and praying to God that He would help me to do that. It can be done. This is a reference guide, a how-to. And believe me, God wants every man and every woman to do that. Overseer here in verse 7, the overseer, we're going to break this verse down a little as we wind down. The overseer must be above reproach. This is not a hierarchical title. It's simply an elder or a leader. You, as you grow into an elder and a leader and mold your life into these precepts given to God, if you desire to do that, you become an elder or a leader. You become a leader in the church. God's steward, I want to key in on this one in verse 7. Something I've learned a lot about and something that I value. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward. One who manages someone else's property. I want to manage God's property. The church belongs to God. And elders and leaders are accountable to him for the way they lead it. You see, I want to manage God's property. I want him to bless me with things. Some things I missed, but it's never too late. I want to be an overseer for him because I can live this way. By If God shows me how, I can do that. I want to lead others. I want to obtain gifts. For eternal life. The Bible says Jesus will reward you. I want to do all that. And I know that all of you desire to do that too. It can be done. This is not beyond any of you. Take a look at Hebrews 13, 17. Let's look at this verse. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them... For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief. For this would be unprofitable for you. How much responsibility do you think a leader has like myself to say, and you wonder why I get up here and say we're honoring the word of God. We're not compromising. Put it in context of this and now let me say it to you again. I'm being held accountable for accountable before God. Do you think we're going to make decisions that are unbiblical? Do you think we're going to apply anything because it feels good or comfortable that is not authorized by God in this New Testament Christian life that we've been given? You see how bold I get when I read this scripture? Ask me if I'm going to do anything that can be found in the Bible to be wrong. And the answer is no. No. Not doing it. How simple is that? 
when I apply the Bible to my life and in being a leader, an overseer, or a pastor, and a caretaker, it becomes so easy. If God says it's good, then it's... If God says it's something that He doesn't like, and we want to apply it to the church, the answer should be no. And this becomes real easy. I love this part. I love this. God is, God is not placing us apart, lost, without direction. That is a lie. You know that. You see now why I'm so content to say, welcome to Brentwood Lighthouse Baptist Church. A traditional, uncompromising, Christ-centered, Bible-teaching church where you will experience God and the opportunity for you to have the desires of your heart will be made most prevalent. And I'm honored to be with you on this journey. These guidelines are always here to help us. I'm here to help any of you anytime. God is using me as a vessel of help in the days that my life remains on this earth. Paul said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I'm comfortable with either one, reaching full maturity and ready at any time. My prayer is God use me as a vessel to help others. Use my life, extend my years, of course. Heal my body, make us live, cause us to have life, and cause these miracles to happen in the men and women of our church because we want you to be honored. Amen? Regarding... Um, not being profitable to you. Uh, I researched this a little bit in verse 8. It says, uh, uh, it says uh, in verse 9, holding fast to the word of God, back to Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be un profitable for you. As I stand committed to God, it does become the church's responsibility to help their leaders teach and preach with joy. And I'm happy that you are charged with helping me be happy to stand on the truth of God, regardless of what the world says or tries to do to me. My joy is to be made complete with you making me comfortable and joyful, preaching the truth, regardless of what the world does to me. And I choose that joy with you more than I choose any reprieve from what the world might do to me. I want to be joyful with you preaching this word, whether it be for one more day or whether it be for 10 more years. It doesn't matter to me. Amen? Amen. 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 We must hold fast to the word of life. We're going to close out here in verse 9. Again, let me read 1 Titus, verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Why any church would deviate from the word of God, I don't know. This is so easy to say, hold fast to the word of truth that is in the Bible. Where did decision making go? When did this become difficult to hold a big boat over a massive church conglomeration and decide if something that is absolutely against this word should be allowed widespread in it? I have no idea where these things even came from. Who is leading in that situation? Satan. Satan is leading when the leader of the church says we're going to adopt a policy and you're like, Pastor, but the Bible says there's something totally wrong with this. And I say, well, we just need a 60% vote and it'll be okay. It's not true. It's not going to happen. I myself am mesmerized at what's happening in the world. I try to keep it to a limit here with you I just want you to know my feelings about that. Verse 9, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute 
those who contradict. We must hold fast to the word of life, the faithful word. This is the sound biblical doctrine that not only should be taught, but also adhered to with deep conviction. We must defend and adhere to the faithful word. The true and faithful word of God is able to deliver your soul from eternal death to eternal life. In closing today, I just want to tell you how absolutely excited I am to be with you in a place, in a church, where we can stand on the faithful word. I would be lost without you in this. I would feel like I was all alone standing on this word, confused why the world refuses to adhere, to hold fast to the faithful word of God. Well, I love being here with you and I love standing on the truth. The Bible says salvation is at hand for anyone who would believe in Christ. I'm going to read two verses. One of them I'm going to read now. And then I'm going to ask anybody if their heart is ready to change. The words won't save you. It is a heart that understands the word, a mind and a heart that is focused and accepting Christ into their life and heart. And then I'm going to read a verse after that, after the prayer. And then Yuki will sing us a song in closing. Listen to Colossians 1, 13 and 14. You notice this is one of my favorite go-to verses. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. If God is calling you today, if you're here, if you're listening virtually, if you're out there, whether it be today, tomorrow, next week, it doesn't matter. When the word of God pierces your heart, it is time. If that's you today and you desire to turn your life over to Jesus Christ, to join this family, to allow the Holy Spirit through forgiveness of your sin, to dwell inside of your heart, pray with me. You can pray with me. If your heart is ready, let me pray. Heavenly Father, I believe in the truth of your word. I come before you today, confessing my sin before you. And Father, I believe that your Son, Jesus Christ, shed his blood on that cross for the forgiveness of my sin. And I accept that gift. I receive the gift of Jesus Christ and your offer of forgiveness today. Please allow the Holy Spirit to come and live in my heart, dwell inside me. And I choose to follow Jesus as my Lord for the remaining days of my life. And God, I make this decision in knowledge of your word. And I believe in you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, I'm going to read one more verse. Uh, you know, we often say, get in a church, it's kind of cliche. Um, but if you did pray and you are turning your life over to Jesus, follow him. Do get in a Bible study. Do adhere to this word. Faith and practice, belief and behavior will accompany. Colossians 2 verse 6. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And I ask you, if you received him, walk in him today walk in him. Have a wonderful day. Sister Yuki will close us with a song. Hold your seat and I'll close us in prayer. Thank you, Yuki. Thank you.